test ah so welcome to the second afternoon talk um i want to proudly introduce mike sperber um also known as bob no um so mike is uh, the, the the founder or boss of uh, active group which is a uh, functional programming enthusiast uh, consulting company that uh, has been working for for quite a while in various functional languages and uh, he's probably most famous as being uh, the main driving force uh, of, of the Bob Conference, which is a, a very nice functionally oriented, oriented uh, conference in Berlin that I've been to a couple of times. And um, yeah, welcome, Mike. Oh, thank you. B Bob, is it good? Is is good? Is it good? It's excellent. I was not so, paid to say this. Yeah. Please. <laughs> So if you've been there, so yeah, so Bob, um, which we just figured out when it's going to be next year. Uh, so it's on, on 17th of March. We hope it's going to be in Berlin. Uh, call, out, call is going to be out by Monday. Um, and there's usually, there's, there's quite, a, quite a bit of room for Haskell related talks and tutorials also. Um, yeah, so thanks to the introduction, I don't really have to go into much detail. So we're not, uh, so we do, um, software development using functional languages, not just in Haskell, but also in Haskell. So I'm going to tell you about one of those Haskell projects. Uh, we, also, uh, we also offer a lot of um, training in that area. In fact, it's, it's gotten to be a lot more this year and even more next year. And we're based in Tübingen. If you're interested, if you speak German, if you're interested in functional programming in general, uh, we have a wide variety of posts on funktionaleprogrammierung.de. Um, um, usually every couple of weeks. Uh, we're also always happy to have guest authors on that blog. So today, this is kind of a mixture between an experience report and um, something something GHC. Um, so you're going to have to help me through this by asking questions if anything is unclear. Uh, so this is part. So this is a report on an industrial project. So we are um, for a large industrial company, also based here in Munich. Um, we are developing a product that is supposed to perform anomaly detection in industrial production processes. So um, all kinds of things. It might be in 3D printing. This is this additive manufacturing. It might be what's called discrete manufacturing when you're making parts. Uh, also, if you're doing things like you know baking, uh, you know if you have a bakery production chain or something like that. And and the problem is, well, sometimes things break. Uh, and so in your typical modern production chain, you have lots of sensors installed. And uh, when things break, sometimes you're, you would be able to spot before things get really, really bad by looking at the sensor output for it. Um, so for example, in you know, food and beverage, product, beverage production, uh, you, might, you might have a cooling unit, right? And you might have, I don't know, power failure or something like that. That would be easy to explain. And even though you might not notice until later, right? Because, of course, your cooling unit will have some amount of insulation. Um, or you might have some heating unit where you set, where you get kind of the opposite effect. So you don't immediately notice there's something wrong. Um, you only notice later. And by that time, there might be more damage. It would be nice if you noticed um, earlier. And so, um, but, but of course, up front, especially when you have lots of sensors, uh, your users are not always going to be able to tell you, well, yeah, if sensor input is like this, it's not always as simple as with the temperature. Uh, so they don't, they're not always able to tell you, well, yeah, if sensor output goes like this, then that means this unit has failed or there's some breakage or uh, something has gone out of spec. Um, and so the idea is to use deep learning in order to uh, automatically figure out what, uh, what an anomaly looks like. And so the idea is to have the very basic idea is to have kind of a predictive model, right? And so, um, so you might have some sensor um, input like the red line here, and then you have some predictive model that sees a little bit into the future, which is the blue corridor that you see here. And when you see kind of the, you know, the red line leaving the blue corridor, then that's uh, an indication that something might have gone wrong. So here on the, on the right-hand side, for example, uh, very roughly. Um, also, um, there's various constraints on this project. In particular, uh, we're dealing with lots of clients that don't want the sensor data to leave the building. Uh, so, uh, you know, you can talk to any number of consultants who will tell you that they've got a great, uh, you know, data processing pipeline in the cloud. Just feed it in there, you know, run a bunch of deep learning on there, and then uh, feed the results back. But, um, you know, this cloud thing up there is not 
always something that clients are able to do. So they have to do their processing locally. And uh, you know, this is not your cozy you know, hipster office that you see here where you can just buy you know, high-powered laptops, but instead uh, you're dealing with industrial computing devices which are on the order of a, like a Raspberry Pi 2 uh, approximately, but very, very sturdy. Um, so we're trying to do that. And so, um, well, I mean, these days, um, when you're trying to start a deep learning project, people will very uh, quickly tell you, well, just use Python, because all the main machine learning and deep learning frameworks are in Python. Here's what that looks like. Uh, so here's what's called an autoencoder. So an autoencoder is a very simple neural network where uh, essentially you squeeze, you have input that you know, goes in any number of dimensions, and you kind of convert it into an, in, in a middle layer that is thinner that doesn't have as many dimensions, and then you kind of um, go back and spread out again. So it's, it's essentially a compression and decompression device. Um, and you can also use that for auto for anomaly detection quite effective, surprisingly effectively. Um, so here you can see there's kind of dimensions. You, you, in the middle, there's something going on where you only have half the dimensions, and then at the end, you have the original number of dimensions. Uh, if you don't read Python, don't worry about it. Um, so, um, and here is the actual structure of the neural network, which has some activation functions. Don't worry if you're not into deep learning. Uh, I'm not into deep learning either. I don't, I don't know what half of these things mean. Uh, so, but, um, I mean, what stands out is you notice this looks like a program that computes on matrices, okay? So you can see matmol and tan h, you know, tangens, you know, the tangent, hyperbolicus, and, and ma matrix multiplication, things like that. These are functions on uh, matrices, yet you see that these functions all com come from a namespace called TF for TensorFlow, which is, well, you know, if you're, if you're kind of just starting out doing numerical analysis and data science with Python, uh, you know, you might think, well, you know, I'm used to using, for example, a library called Pandas. I don't know if you're in Python, there's a library called Pandas, which a lot of people use to import your, you know, CSV files and do calculations on that, and that has perfectly fine uh, matrix arithmetic on it, right? And yet, uh, TensorFlow comes with its own uh, function. So if you have a Pandas program and you then want to use that as a basis for a neural network, you have to rewrite it, essentially. So why is that? Well, the answer is that TensorFlow really doesn't run your Python program. Instead, it runs what's called a graph. So they have a compute the data flow graph, essentially. Um, so your um, autoencoder might generate this graph here. And you can probably not see that, but there is a box there, a uh, circle in red, where it says gradient tape. And you can kind of zoom in. So what's the gradient tape? Well, there's another, you know, uh, actually much more detailed graph. So there's a lot more computation behind, behind that. And uh, this is for computing the gradient, because what you're doing, essentially, when you're uh, training a neural network, is you're, you're, following, um, you're following the gradient, so the slope uh, of something in order to reach, to optimize your, um, your neural network with, uh, with respect to your fitness function. So uh, in order to compute the gradient, you need a derivative. So, and that's what that, you know, that gradient thing was, this thing here, is it computes a derivative. And um, this is almost the derivative that you learn about in school. Um, there's one marked difference between, be because you're usually the fitness function is usually something that has a lot of inputs. So you might have you know, a gazillion inputs, which are all your, uh, the parameters for a neural network, and just one number as the output, yet you want the derivative with respect to all of the inputs. And you can do that with each input individually, right? doing what's called a forward derivative. That's the derivative that you, that you learn about in school. But that's very inefficient because you have to do it separately for each dimension. Um, so you really want something. I mean, just just remember this thing. We're, we just need to do this backwards, uh, where we can get all the gradients, essentially in one pass, right? Doing a backwards derivative. And so there's. Um, uh, I mean, you might have seen that it says gradient tape here. So there's complicated algorithms that uh, calculate the backwards derivatives, but essentially by running your computation forward, and creating a trace of what you did, and then kind of backtracking on that trace. Um, so it's complicated. It's imperative. It's not the kind of thing that we like to do uh, when we're in Haskell. So, um, so in, in Python, so how does that work behind the scenes, you might ask? So in Python, in order to do anything these days with TensorFlow, what you do is you stick an annotation on a function. And you, well, what, what, does, that, what does that mean? When you, or what happens when you stick an annotation on that function? 
what happens is that the TensorFlow machinery then has a complete Python front end that parses, statically analyzes the code, uh, and then generates the graph that you saw on the previous slide. So there's an entire Python implementation hiding behind that annotation. Um, and so overall, it's just a clunky piece of machinery, right? Because Python is not the most pleasant um, language to process. So the folks at Google that have lots of, uh, that can pay lots of <laughs> programmer hours, I guess, um, you know, spend a lot of effort on, on making that work. Previously, what you had to do was you had to write a Python program that would generate the graph, construct the graph imperatively. And this way, you have a little bit more convenience. But um, you know, it took a huge amount of effort to do that. So, um, but of course, you know, it's kind of nice because you can use a lot, you know, code from lots of sources. Python, the Python ecosystem just has a lot of stuff, and you can benefit from Google's huge investment into the TensorFlow framework. Or you could just get, you know, you can get whatever the fi the Facebook thing, PyTorch, which also has seen a huge amount of investment, and you can benefit from that. And so, um, you know, foolishly maybe. Um, well, maybe well, we'll get to the foolish part in a moment, but um, but there's also some issues, right? Uh, so I'm not really an advocate of static types, but here the absence of static types really hurts you, because uh, I don't know about you, but when I write like expressions with matrices and so on, I tend to get dimensions wrong, uh, uh, right? And I can can never remember is it the rows and the columns and you know how, which way do they go with each other, and. Uh, the thing is, of course, with Python, when something goes wrong there, you only get an error at runtime, and the run and the error only mentions concrete numbers, right? Usually, having concrete examples for problems is good, but here, really, what you're—I um, mean—but but here, it's unclear where those dimensions come from. Even worse, it might be that you're not getting a runtime error, but you have a bug in your program anyway, just because you have quadratic matrices and you got it wrong. And so dealing with errors is just a pain, uh, not just in, in theory, but also in practice. And then you have to convert your, I think, you know, my coworkers were like, you know, we had this, they actually made this mistake the other day uh, that they wrote this code at the top. And the fix is then to do that code at the bottom, adding another level of indirection, uh, you know, putting a list around things. So great, but um, hard to tell from the error message that you saw before. So. Um, uh, so really what we'd like to have is we'd really like to have a declarative way of writing um, um, uh, of writing neural networks. And you could write an autoencoder declaratively like this, where uh, what you're saying was well, your autoencoder really is this pipeline or this composition of four different layers. That's great. Uh, you know, you can explain that to somebody in a couple of minutes. Um, and uh, you know, you can see in the types that there's you know, two different uh, dimensionalities involved, um, the F and the G, right? You can also see that this code has been completely abstracted over concrete vector types, right? These have all been, these are all functors, Q and P, uh, all denote um, matrices of certain dimensionalities. And so, you know, when we started out, we knew we wanted to, uh, we wanted to uh, deploy deep learning neural networks on these tiny devices. And we felt that we didn't sufficiently understand uh, the Python machinery, which is really heavy duty, to really be confident that we could make it run. So we foolishly decided we were just going to do it all in Haskell. Um, so, uh, so and, and we were really seduced by this, right? I'm still happy with the choice that we made, but I think we got a little bit more than we signed up for. Um, so, but, but um, you know, First of all, it means that, well, if we can somehow make this work, right, and not just have it run, but also being able to train it and compute the and optimize the parameters, then that would be really nice because we have regular workable numerical code that you could run directly. And what's called eager mode uh, is this thing where you run the Python code directly. It's just plain Haskell. We don't have to have any special um, support for that um, to make that work. And um, also, of course, if you were kind of into um, abstraction, then um, really, you know, you. Uh, well, you might think about, well, how are we going to generalize all these vectors? You can generalize vectors into something called uh, a representable functor. So you start off with a functor, and essentially you have, uh, for that functor, here's a, uh, here's a type family called key that just tells you what the set of indices are. Right? Representable functors means that you can extract the dimensions by mentioning uh, an index type, if you will, uh, or a key type. And so all of that works out nicely. Um, 
and you get really nice type errors for a change from GHC, which you don't usually do, but uh, you really get at the type error. If you confuse your functors, it's just going to tell you, well, I couldn't match type G with type F, um, completely independently from the fact that one of, the, one of them might later turn out to be a vector of four and the other one, the other one a vector of three or something. So far, so good. Uh, Anyway, so that's, uh, that's nice. Um, and, and coincidentally, when I prepared the first version of this talk, I saw on Twitter that the, the PyTorch people, uh, I think, which has, um, I think Ed Yang, prominent Haskell programmer, is on the PyTorch team. So my guess is uh, this idea came from him, where you can just annotate uh, your vectors, not just with concrete numbers for dimensionalities, but you can just stick letters on them, and then you get error messages in terms of these letters if they don't match up. Um, so, um, uh, so, yeah, so we wanted to implement uh, deep learning. This was, I think, about three years ago. We wanted to implement deep learning in Haskell and then make that into a deployable industrial application. Um, and so, um, you know, we followed, I'll later have a picture of him, but um, so, so first thing that you need to think about when you're doing that um, is, is, well, you need to compute a derivative, right? And in school, we learn that a derivative is just a number, right? So you have some, uh, some function from the real numbers to the real numbers, and the derivative is just the slope of the tangent that you have here, right? So it's that limit that you have here. So that's really nice for simple functions that are just from the reals to the reals, but the problem is that it doesn't easily, this definition that you see up there doesn't easily generalize to arbitrary dimensions, right? Because at some point, your epsilon can't be a number anymore. It also has to be a matrix. You have to divide by it. And then, uh, well, that doesn't work anymore. So you've got to think about partial derivatives and Jacobians. And um, I am too old. I, don't, I, I honestly have trouble fitting all of this stuff in my head at the same time. So, um, uh, so a nice alternative formulation is to think about, well, uh, we are just going to uh, we're going to think of the derivative not as a number, but as a function. And that function is just an approximation of the original function. And you know, its special property is that it's linear. So, and linear just means that it is its own derivative. right? So, you have, uh, so we have this idea that you have this d operator up there. You feed in a function from a to b. And you get out a function that computes the derivative. So, it, again, it takes in an a. That's the point here. And it gives you that thing with a little circle at the end is just for linear function. It gives you a linear function from A to B, which is that approximation. And so, um, you know, Connell made that nicely accessible um, in a paper or uh, in a paper on uh, how to automatically do derivatives. And you can directly essentially translate this into, um, um, into a Haskell type. But the question is how, you know, what does the definition for that look like, right? The type looks nice, but what does the definition look for that? Um, and the problem is, so, and, and, and the problem is, of course, that, well, if f is a function from a to b, you, I mean, uh, you know, computing the derivative is a symbolic operation, but you only have the compiled code. So how are you going to get at the symbolic representation, or can you somehow bypass that in order to still get a derivative? And so, um, um, and the problem is, of course, that we are, we're, we're usually used to constructing functions by writing lambda expressions you know, in some form or another in Haskell. Um, but there's another way of doing that is uh, somebody mentioned, uh, you know, point free, I mean, lots of people like writing point free stuff, uh, point free functions in Haskell, which I personally hate because things don't have names that would make the code more accessible. But in principle, yeah, I see a couple of people going, yeah, yeah, oh, he's so old. He, he wants names on things. Um, but um, of course, you can also construct functions by uh, sort of the same methods that we use to construct a lot of other things, which is to have sort of a combinator library for constructing functions, right? So we have primitive functions, and then we can compose larger functions from smaller functions, for example, through sequential composition, right? Um, and, um, and that's not the only form of composition, right? Another form of composition is sort of parallel composition. So we have two functions that take an A, produce a C and a D each, and you can convert that um, uh, to a function that will go from, uh, I think there's a type, I think it should say a arrow cxd there. It says there in the Haskell type. Um, so, but just read the Haskell code, right? Uh, and I think you can see where that is going. So we have parallel composition. And you, so you can think of various ways of 
composing functions. So if you have a set of primitive functions and a couple of means of composition, you kind of have an algebra for functions, for constructing functions. And uh, then, well, what is this thing composition, right? We know that it also happens in category theory. Maybe we can apply sort of concepts from category theory to make that usable. Um, and uh, maybe that will then provide a hint how to compute, how to then get at the derivatives. And so um, the idea behind Connell's work is, well, we're going to replace, uh, first of all, we're going to start by just defining what it means to be a category. Category just means that you have an identity and you have a composition, but you have something that's more general than functions. You have what's usually called arrows or morphisms in categories, okay? And so the idea is to give these morphisms, just to abstract over them, that is your K that you see up there, okay? So the K is something that can take the place of the usual Haskell arrow. Arrow, I should go the other way around. So, right? And so you can see here that, for example, identity then is, usually it's a arrow a, and here it just says a k a. So we're going to abstract over, you know, what goes there. And then, of course, composition is you have an amorphism that goes from a to b, you have a morphism that goes from b to c, and you can compose those into a morphism that goes from a to c, right? And then, well, the idea is then you use those instead of the regular id function in the prelude or the regular dot that also sits in the prelude. Um, and you can, define, uh, uh, you can define more advanced features for categories in terms of type classes. So if you're a category, one of the typical things is that you have products. Um, for lots of things, it just suffices to take regular Haskell tuples, but there's at least a definition there that you can generalize where, well, if you have a product in your category of an A and a B, you can project out the A, you can project out the B, or you can duplicate uh, an A into a product of two A's, right? Does that make sense? So these are sort of very fundamental constructions that you can, um, that have, uh, that are analogous to constructions in category theory. Uh, there's also called something called a monoidal product cat, which has this operation here, uh, where, uh, well, if you have something going from A to C, something goes from B to D, you can you can kind of have these run in parallel, and from that you can construct that function that you saw earlier, uh, which you know takes something from A to C, something from A to D, and then gives you something from A to the product of C and D. Don't have to remember any of the specifics. The point is that there's an algebra for constructing functions that allow you to write functions without mentioning a lambda. Okay, that's the important part here. Um, um, more importantly, eventually, so as you move up the set of features that you might have in a category, eventually you're going to get to something called a closed category that has essentially higher order functions, if you will, right? And so it has a, uh, it has a curry and an uncurry and an ap apply, which, uh, you know, gives you what's, what's called an exponential, right? Which is just a regular Haskell function um, in, in the concrete implementation. Okay, so far? So don't, don't be afraid to butt in if something is not, uh, is, is, is is not easily comprehensible. So um, now the thing is that um, it, you know we want to do derivatives, right? And so we can think of how is derivatives, how are derivatives defined in, in terms of the means of composition that we have here. Um, and so ideally, we would define the derivative of a composition of two functions as somehow something of the derivatives of the two individual functions. And so something like that, you might have learned in school called the chain rule. Uh, which says, well, if you have, you know, f and g, and you compose them, then you can compute their derivative by, well, doing this thing up there, right? And if you stare at this long enough and look at the types, you can see that it works out. And you can see, well, very nice, right? It says df there, right? Uh, so, yeah, so this is in terms of the derivative of f. And it says dg, but unfortunately, it also says f of a, right? So it's not enough to have the derivatives of f and g in order to compute the derivative of the composition of g and f. Okay, you need also the value of, um, uh, of uh, you, the, 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 the value of applying f to a. So, you know, this is the problem, right? The f of a is there. So just a minor problem. So what you can do in this case, you can just kind of enrich your notion of derivatives to just stick that in there as well. And you eventually come up with this definition, d plus, where you don't just go from A to B to A to the linear function that is the derivative, 
but you also just stick in the b, which is the value of the function along with it. You can see the difference there. And then I can, def I can define the derivative compositionally, where I just go, well, d plus of g of f is just, um, you know, it's just something in terms of d plus of f and d plus of g, right? And then, um, so, so you stick a little bit more in your, in your domain there, and then you can have compositional differentiation. And so, um, again, that translates quite easily to a definition in Haskell. And, uh, you know, and then I can just give implementations of all these various type classes that are involved with, that, are, that have to do with categories. And, uh, you know, if I then write my program in this style of composing it from primitives using the means of composition, then I can immediately have a, uh, immediately have a derivatives by just mentioning um, that specific type here that we want. So far, so good. Um, so that's that's all very nice. Um, so uh, oh, duplicated slide. Anyway, so uh, and then there's um, so so there's this. So we can now come out, So we can now express functions in two different ways: the regular Haskell way by using lambdas and names, and the other way is by writing by using primitives and using composition. And uh, there's a paper by Joachim Lambeck from. 1980 that just shows that at least the simply type lambda calculus is just equivalent to this. So you can take an expression in the simply type lambda calculus and you can convert it to this categorical form that doesn't have explicit lambdas in it. And that was kind of the basis for Connell's work on compiling categories that you might have heard. Um, and um, so, and just, there's just, uh, do I have, oops. Uh, so here's how that works. Maybe I should jump ahead. Right, and so, uh, for example, so the idea is this, right, and, and, and so you can uh, transform this in the following way. So, for example, if you have a lambda expression like the one at the top, right, it's, it just says lambda x uh, u applied to v, and what you can do then is remember we had these closed categories that has an apply function, so you can just use apply of u comma v of that tuple um, uh, and transform it this way. Then you can tra transform it by uh, introducing uh, more lambdas and using this and 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 operator that you saw earlier, um, and uh, that then gives you. And the last step allows you to eliminate the lambda and just uh, just express it as a composition of these two things, right? And then you can go and recursively transform uh, lambda x goes to u and lambda x goes to v there, and hopefully it's all going to work out at the end, right? If things work out nicely. Um, so, um, uh, and so that's the basic idea behind this compiler pi pipeline. So the idea is to use regular Haskell code that is written using lambdas. Uh, you have GHC com compile it into, well, uh, you know, core uh, into the type lambda calculus. Then there is a, a plugin that Connell wrote, uh, the Concat plugin, that compiles it into this categorical form, which is still Haskell expressions. It's just Haskell expressions without lambdas. Um, and then ideally, uh, we can generalize. We'll talk about that later and convert that into executable code. And then things will just run any way that you'd like them to run. So far, so good. Okay. Uh, so how? So maybe at the back of your mind, it was like, yeah, Mike explained how to do the forward derivative, the derivative that we learned about in school. But in the beginning, I mentioned that you really need a backward derivative, the reverse derivative that you have there. So at the top, you see the definition of the forward derivative, and you can see that it's abstracted over sort of the underlying category, right? So there's a k parameter there, and I can stick another thing in there. Um, and um, so I can stick another category. And in particular, I can define uh, what's called a dual category. For any, ca any category, it's dual, where the morphisms just go the other way, and that sort of sounds like reversal, right? Uh, where the morphisms go the other way, they also form a category, and you can just explain that again as, um, as a type dual that is again abstracted over the underlying category, which has to be linear, but that happens to be the case in, in what we're trying to do here uh, for, for everything that we need to do. So, um, so we really, so what we can do is we can just combine these two things, as it were, uh, the general derivative with this dual construction, and that will just give us reverse differentiation without all the hassle of these complicated tape algorithms that you see in TensorFlow. Okay? And it just works out nicely. Um, so, um, uh, so 
but uh, well, how does this plugin work? That's a question that comes out a lot also in sort of when, when new people um, in our office are trying to deal with it. And I'll, I'll try to explain it, but it's, you, maybe, you might need to help me. So how does this translation to categorical form work? It works very nicely on paper, but um, you might know that, well, GHC does a lot of things internally that interact with this translation to categorical form. So the first step is pretty simple. Well, of course, in our regular Haskell program, we usually use regular functions like map and whatever, um, um, all kinds of things, that are not abstracted yet over the Haskell arrow, right? And so somehow we first need to push things into those, uh, those funky new type classes that we just saw. And so the first step is to replace standard operators by the ones that have a K parameter. As you just replace them, they will just have a regular arrow there, and things kind of work out. And then we want to transform this into this categorical term that doesn't have any lambdas anymore. And then you want to replace the arrow by the target category. right? So um, that's how that's supposed to work. So the first step is really simple. Well, uh, you just give GHC a bunch of rules that just tell, you, tell it to, well, you know, if somebody says fmap, you just replace it by something called fmapc, which is from one of those type classes that we saw. right? And there's a whole army of those rules. Um, sitting in the concat code. If you did just that, right, your program would still work. Uh, the only difference is that you have all kinds of types where, uh, where for the k, the k is instantiated by the regular Haskell arrow. Then we could transform that to a categorical term. Um, and then we could just look at, um, uh, then we can look at the core code. And you can see here, this is what comes out, for example. You remember there was a function sum a, which just uh, computes the sum of, a, of one of those uh, representable functors. So typically the sum of all the elements in a vector or something like that. And it gets replaced by that GHC rule by a function called sum a c that as its type parameter has a, this k thing. And that k thing is instantiated to the regular Haskell arrow. That's what you see up there, right? And so at that point, you just go and replace it by your target category. Remember, this was the reverse differentiation category. So that's a fairly, well, seemingly fa fairly easy step. Um, so it used to be fairly simple. But um, so one issue there that you might notice is, well, we're now you know, we're replacing one, essentially one type class instance by another. The one that we're replacing it by might have different prerequisites than the one before, right? And so we need to uh, run um, GHC's type class inference machinery in order to create the type class instances that weren't needed by the expression at the top, but that are needed uh, by the expression down there. And this, um, so Christoph helped us do this, um, by the way, uh, because we couldn't figure out how, to, how GHC worked. Um, and, um, um, and he helped us figure that out. Um, and, and the way we need to interact with GHC. So far, so good. So that's what this plugin does, right? It does these three things. It replaces the standard operators by the categorical ones. It transforms to a categorical term. So it, you know, that's the easy step. It transforms using the, essentially the rules by Joachim Lambig into this categorical form. And then we replace uh, this arrow by the target category, you know, and then hopefully making the type classes uh, come out right. Um, so, and that, that's how that works. Now that we've done this, of course, um, you know, we, we did this. It's all been working for a while now. It's actually been shipped um, uh, for a year, I think, now. Uh, but then they came out, uh, oh, we now have one of these, uh, you know, edge devices that has a GPU. Can we make the GPU run? Of course, there's a great um, Haskell library for, um, for driving GPUs with the Accelerate libraries. Um, uh, the Accelerate library done by uh, Gabi Keller's group in, in Utrecht, uh, mainly Trevor McDonald, who's doing that. And, um, and, and one of the fun things is that, well, Accelerate just says, you're not writing regular function, you're not writing regular Haskell functions that operate on vectors. You're only kind of pretending to do that. Instead, what you're doing is you're writing a Haskell function that generates um, uh, that, gener that, that manipulates symbolic values, and doing that constructs a symbolic expression that you can then compile to a GPU code. And so it kind of redefines what it means to be a function. And that might sound familiar, because that's exactly what we did originally, right? We re redefined functions 
to be these things that carry their derivatives, and we might also redefine functions as something that, um, you know, that carries enough information for accelerate, and that turns to be the case. So we can just implement a Cartesian closed category, all the relevant type classes for that in terms of these accelerate functions. Um, there's a slight mismatch there, and uh, there's a few mismatches there that sometimes relegate things to runtime. Um, but given the fact that the original source program is well-constructed, things um, always work out uh, well in the end. So we were quite pleased with that, even though it took us, took us a while to figure out. So, um, and so it means that we run the plugin twice, right? We run it once to compute the derivative, and then we just immediately transform it again in order to transform it to code that can run on the GPU. So, and, and making this pipeline robust is currently what I'm working on. So maybe I'll get to a little hacking here if anybody's interested in that. Um, so, you know, when we started out, we thought this theory behind this is so beautiful, and we're just going to make that work. Uh, we uh, didn't realize how deeply we would, had, we would have to get into GHC's guts and have to work out, uh, you know, corner cases in the plugin to make that work. Um, but, uh, you know, we've done quite a bit of that. So a couple of challenges in there are that, um, so as you're looking, so as I mentioned that we're constructing functions from primitives by means of compositions, but these primitive functions are, usually, are not always constant, right? They might also just be the result of applying a function to some argument. And so the plugin needs to know when does, you know, what's the, what's, you know, where's the border between, you know, that application that's supposed to generate my primitive and uh, where I have something that actually goes into my category and it sometimes missteps. Um, and so we've, you know, we've put a lot of work into sort of making that work better. Um, the plugin sometimes because it, it's not always dealing with you know, beautifully you know, formatted lambda calculus, but it has intermediate code that instantiates type classes, uh, type class instances, dictionaries. The latest thing that I've been looking at is typable instances, which don't look like the regular instances, and so on. And so the plugin um, has to kind of move past that, and so it gets to the meat of the problem. And getting to the meat of the code also often means inlining. So it's only, it's, of course, right as you're writing your Haskell code, it's consisting of multiple function definitions, but this transformation has to work on the entire expression. And so uh, the plugin uh, is, in quite a few situations, it can't immediately apply one of its transformation rules. And when it can't do that, well, uh, it's not clear that it's the right thing to give up. Instead, you might just inline a little bit more, and then uh, you might get code that uh, is susceptible to the, to the transformation. Uh, I mentioned this thing that, uh, well, for polymorphic code, well, you have to generate the dictionaries just right. Moreover, your source program then also has to have the right prerequisites that GHC didn't tell you about on the first pass, right? So um, if that's opaque, that's okay. But you have to write type class. So essentially what you have to do is you have to write type signatures that contain um, class instances, even though GHC will not will not complain if you leave them out because they are needed by the output code rather than by the input code. And that makes sense. Well, transforming twice is a challenge because you can massage your input code manually to make it go through the plugin, but then you have generated code, which you can't massage directly. Um, uh, we've put a lot of headaches, has given us, we've had a lot of headaches because of these new type wrappers, right? These new type wrappers, which end up in the output code of the first pass, uh, in the, of the first pass, but then have to be transformed by the second pass. And and Joachim, is Joachim here? Joachim has helped us do that uh, because the coercion, the, the the coercion stuff, we couldn't even read the core output, and Connell also had trouble doing that. And so we were very glad that Joachim helped us do that. Um, and so generally, there's, uh, there's a part of the project, I mean, even though we've had our, uh, you know, our deep learning wizards uh, who, are, who had more mainly mathematical training uh, be very successful at writing uh, the neural networks, then actually getting that run through the plugin requires, uh, you know, skills at the intersection of a little bit of the math involved, a little bit of the category theory involved, a little bit of GHC and general compiler knowledge. and. Um, the only one old enough to have that currently is me, unfortunately. Um, so I'd, I'd like that to be easier. Uh, but once you get there, you can do all kinds of things. So if you were at Bob um, uh, this year, 
there was a company called Kitty Hawk that makes uh, autonomous, uh, like uh, battery driven taxis. And the software that drives them is also written uh, using, using that same approach, so using, uh, using compiling to categories. They have their entirely, they've, they've entirely rewritten the plugin to be much more robust, but also uh, it also currently has some limitations, especially regarding the polymorphism. And we, uh, I hope one of these days I can actually find enough time to merge those two efforts. Uh, but it's really nice, and so you know, if we get that to be robust, uh, it's just going to be a useful framework for doing all kinds of things. So um, um, uh, you know, we get essentially well free, <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, once you have that infrastructure in place, you get very nice code to describe your neural networks, um, and then just having that uh, will then generate uh, pretty efficient code out on the G GPU. Uh, it's um, I think a lot of the code that we have still has this idea that you're dealing with vectors and matrices, and I think really in deep learning, that's a general issue, is that everything gets turned into matrix multiplication, and we really conceptually want to move past that, and the whole terminology and culture of the field is working against that. And uh, you know, hopefully at the end of this effort, we'll have more robust and more generally usable compiler tools. That's it. So. Questions? Yeah, uh, I had a question. So uh, in my talk yesterday, I mentioned that in uh, Haskell, we can't really like represent the product category. But if you do this kind of encoding, you can actually represent it, especially like essentially what I said is like the issue is that um, we, we just have one notion of arrow, which is mm -hmm. the, the function yeah. arrow. Yeah. And so what I'm thinking is like, okay, so you're doing all of this work to try to um, have a, to to compile lambda calculus code to uh, to category theory, mm -hmm. but what is, like wouldn't another wouldn't another possibly approach be to just write it in categorical style in the first place? And maybe I mean with the current way that the combinators look and stuff, it looks kind of terrible. But like if when you do category theory proofs, you work a lot with diagrams and, and things mm -hmm. like that. I think that would be like a completely different approach. What do you think about that? Um, I think I'd have to see it. Uh, I, so it's definitely worth trying out um, 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 doing that. So the idea would be to have like a graphical editor for this. Is I think that's what you need, right? Yeah. Because the I can tell you that in some cases where we weren't immediately able to push things through the plugin, we write we manually rewrote the code in the beginning. Um, you know, and, and as we were trying to figure out figure out the plugin, and I can tell you the code did not get more readable as a result of that, um, right? So, but but diagram doing it diagrammatically might help. Uh, so it's an interesting idea. I'll take that home. Thank you. Anyone else? Um. So you, you said you're helping some company with deep learning. You're using yeah. compiling two categories to do that. Yeah, I see. So you're. Uh, so this is. Uh, so we're we're the software company, right? Um, and so we're dealing with a large industrial German company mm -hmm. that makes products for industrial manufacturing, right? So, so I, I guess my question is. How are you exactly doing that, and why did you choose to do that? I don't think it was clear to me. Why did we choose to do that? Uh, money? No, uh, uh, use uh, <laughs> compiling to categories, the approach. So we were very, I mean, first of all, I mean, we really want to do things using functional programming. Um, as I can tell you that in the analysis, so very early on the project, we evaluated various approaches, not just deep learning for finding anomalies. And so. Um, at that point, we weren't ready to express everything in Haskell yet, so we tried, uh, you, you know, this code is something that we actually, so that I didn't write for this talk, but uh, that actually got written as part of the analysis phase, okay? And, um, and the report that I got from the developers is it didn't make them particularly happy doing that because they were running into, you know, this kind of problem. Oops, this kind of problem. Particular, right? And it's just it's it's just very difficult. And you know, imagine doing that not just with 
you know, a couple lines, but really with more complicated uh, neural network, which we were investigating at the time. And so it, it didn't make my programmers happy, right? So, um, so that was the beginning of that. And then, um, uh, you know, we had Connell talk at Bob a couple years ago also about what he was doing. And so we felt this was really something that we wanted to try. Uh, okay. So as I mentioned, right, looking at this from a business perspective, this probably would have been cheaper by now, at least. Um, but also, uh, I mean, we control a lot of the, you know, a lot of the parts of this pipeline now. Um, and so as we're adapting that for new hardware, um, and as we're trying to make it fit on small devices and things like that, we have a lot more leeway doing that in Haskell than with the complicated TensorFlow machinery. So um, I feel still that um, as far as sort of a risk assessment is concerned, um, this, is, this, this was the right way to do it. So am I right thinking that you compile down to a TensorFlow category that then... No, 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 executed? this runs directly. Um, directly. I, ironically, well, so, well, I should have. So, so one of the things that our client asks us to do, I think that's a dead, probably a dead end by now, but Google makes like little tensor processing USB sticks, mm -hmm. right? And so at some point, uh, if you're dealing with large clients, right, decisions change quickly about every quarter. Uh, and so one quarter they had this idea, well, we can just have, you know, we can just buy lots of those things and just have people stick them into their little, little devices and this way speed up the neural network computation. And they commissioned us to, um, so, so they, they enabled us to commission um, uh, Gabby's and Trevor's group to extend Accelerate as a backend for that. And ironically, uh, Accelerate now has a TensorFlow backend because coming from Google, the way to drive this is doing TensorFlow. So you can, okay. <laughs> you can, <laughs> you can go this circle, whole thing in yeah. circles now. Uh, That's cool. Right. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so at the beginning, you mentioned that uh, well, it was problematic to uh, well, do uh, anomaly detection with deep learning because how uh, low performant these industry uh, computers are. Uh, in which way does your approach with category theory uh, fix this? Um, uh, not directly. Um, so, but in the fact, I mean, I mean, one thing that you can do is right. You can compile a Haskell program into a static binary that you can just deploy on those things, right? You don't need any. So, whereas the Python machine, the, the TensorFlow machinery is a lot more heavyweight in that that graph has to be computed. That graph gets executed, essentially gets interpreted, uh, in some sense, um, and uh, so. I mean, you can probably make it run, um, but we weren't confident that we could. That we would have enough control over that infrastructure that we could um, that we could be sure that it would work, right? And so, at the beginning of this kind of project, you do a risk assessment, and this was definitely. I mean, this was very much colored by the fact that we really wanted to do this in Haskell, right? Um, but um, uh, so there's that, and so it was probably skewed by that. But we were genuinely con concerned that we wouldn't be able to control the complexity of the TensorFlow framework to deploy it on this kind of device, right? And uh, you know, somebody might Google this and mention, oh, but there's TensorFlow Lite, right? Uh, which is supposed to be the lightweight embedded version, but TensorFlow Lite, I don't even know, I mean, it uses like 32-bit floats. Uh, so I'm not even sure of the numerical stability of the, uh, and it comes with a lot of hassle anyway, so. Um, uh, so, and that would, be, that would move it even, you know, more beyond our control was our reasoning at the time. Whereas with this, right, um, I mean, the main problem is that um, there's not that many people in the company that have the, uh, that have the right intersection of things to work on the plugin. Once, I'm hopefully, hopefully we're gonna move past that and then it's genuinely going to be a sort of a democratized tool to do this. And then it'll, um, it'll genuinely be a better tool than, uh, than the Python TensorFlow PyTorch stuff will be. Great, right, thank you. Uh, did you consider an approach using an embedded DSL, maybe with GADTs, for encoding the type system instead of using Haskell as a surface syntax? Uh, so no. That, yeah. no, not really. Because it would like simplify a lot of, so you don't need to dig into GHC, you can use like classical approaches from interpreter or compiler implementation. Well, but you still have the problem that you have lambdas, right? Um, and well, you, you cannot allow lambdas, so. 
well, that being my point, right? But we wanted to write code using lambdas. Okay. Um, so, and I know there's ways around that, but uh, uh, Trevor just gave a talk on how to get around some of the limitations around that. But it, it, it uh, my feeling is that it involves similar levels of trickery um, mm -hmm. as this one, as this does. So, uh, I wonder whether you tried or compared to the approach of just using template Haskell to quote it and then compile it. Um, be possible, but template Haskell has so many things wrong with it that I'm kind of, I can't even begin. <laughs> so I'm from the scheme, I'm originally from the scheme and racket community. And so looking at template Haskell, is just like, we want to stay away from that. Um, <laughs> so as far as possible, I'm sorry. Uh, so maybe you're right, but I'm, I'm not the right person to do this. Um. Uh, when you express a neural network on the Haskell type system, how good are the GHC error messages, especially when the network gets really complicated? Uh, pretty good. Um, so that's that's really, I mean, you really get the kinds of issues where you can see, oh, you, you know, you had something that was, um, uh, wh where you essentially had transposition happening, right? That's the typical thing that you get wrong with the matrices. And you really get error messages along uh, like this, these lines. So that's not the issue, right? The issue really, so, but uh, I'm gonna answer the, qu the question that you didn't really ask, right? Um, I mentioned this issue that your transform code needs more type class instances than your original code, right? And so the error messages for that, they get generated by the plugin. But sometimes the plugin also, uh, there's, there's several places where it's perfectly legitimate for a type class implementation to not exist. So for example, you remember that uh, I said that you can transform the simply type lambda calculus to closed categories. One thing I didn't mention is that the derivative category is not closed, right? And so the plugin, when it gets to that point, it would, it would really like things to be closed, right? To have an implementation of that type class. Uh, uh, but if it isn't, it, there's other things it can do. And it's then able to successfully transform it. And so one of the pragmatic issues is that, uh, I mean, what we do a lot is we look at, so the plugin will say, well, this type class isn't implemented, this constraint isn't implemented. And to separate out the stuff that is where it's OK that it's not implemented, and the stuff where it isn't. And uh, to automate that would be great help, but um, so far we haven't had the time to do that in a more user-friendly way, if that makes any sense. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Um, you. So when you say that the derivative category is not closed, does that mean it doesn't support higher order functions? Yeah, okay. yeah exactly. So I think Connell has idea, he has a draft paper on how to make it closed, but um, it's, uh, for me, that's crossing over into esoterics, um, but um, maybe it'll be practical some, at some point. Um, you mentioned that uh, Kitty Hawk made the plugin more robust. Were yeah. those changes uh, upstream, or is it just their fork? Uh, no, it's not just, not just a fork. They really rewrote it, and they really um, so. And I think that's ultimately necessary to make it robust, right? It's, it's, it's not going to happen by refactoring. So they took a couple of pieces, for example, the stuff that we looked at, you, at with you, right? The stuff about dictionary building. Uh, they took some of the pieces of the old plugin, but the, the, the core transformation in order to do something about these issues, right? About the unsaturated applications and so on. So it has machinery that solves that problem. Um, but that really requires a rewrite um, of the plugin. Is, does that answer all yeah, of your yes. question? Right. You. And so uh, I think ultimately the way to go will be to go with their plugin, but that means porting some of the stuff that we've done um, over to theirs. And we just haven't had the time to do that yet. No more questions? Then thank you, Mike. Thank you. Um, yeah.